Trillions of dollars worth of international trade are at risk because of the underwater threat of the Houthis. Iraq has once again become the focus of conflict between the superpowers. Tehran was able to bypass the economic sanctions of Washington and London and secretly transfer funds around the world, including from Russia and China. So let's take a closer look at what happened this week in our neighborhood. Over the past three months, the world has gotten accustomed to the reality of the Red Sea, a shipping route through which roughly 12% of world trade passes being under siege of the Houthi rebels in Yemen. The stated goal of the Houthis is to pressure the major global powers enough for them in turn to pressure Israel to end the war on Hamas in Gaza. As it is with ideologically driven goals, there is little wiggle room while negotiating with religiously supercharged political and military movements. Unsurprisingly, the US is pushing back. On Sunday, the U.S. military announced that it attacked five more missiles that the Houthis were preparing to launch towards the Red Sea, a day after the U.S. and Britain attacked 36 targets throughout Yemen. This was the third combined attack of the two countries in recent weeks. It is clear the Houthis took casualties, but clearly this is not sufficient to prevent them from continuing their attacks. On the contrary, there is now a fear of escalation. Let's try and break this down, because there's a lot going on here. 17% of global digital communication is conveyed through 16 underwater cables that pass through the Bab el Mandab Strait, which is located west of Yemen. The capacity of all the cables in the Red Sea is about 180 terabytes per second. Needless to say, this includes a great deal of information critical to the conduct of business between the Far East and Europe, two of the world's biggest producing and consuming regions. The Houthis know all about this, and they may be considering an attack on the critical piece of global infrastructure. Now, these 16 cables are all vulnerable because the sections that run closest to the coast of Yemen are only at a depth of around 100 meters, and they are concentrated in one narrow section. The Houthis thus have the theoretical ability to cut these vulnerable sections with explosive charges with little effort and time required considering the damage. And it wouldn't even be very difficult or take very long. Even at greater depths of up to 300 meters, the cables are still vulnerable to an attack by an Iranian midget submarine. And such an attack could be conducted without warning and possibly even go undetected until the damage was done. Damage to these cables would have immediate and dramatic consequences. Another important aspect of the communication passing through these cables is electronic financial transfers. Let me explain. Every day, an estimated $1.7 billion, many of these are transfers that are done automatically between long-term supply chain and contractors. Some of it is e-commerce with individuals buying things online and paying with their credit cards. Millions of jobs and even many hundreds of thousands of lives depend on the system running smoothly and without interruption. If it were interrupted, even for a short time, the results would be catastrophic for countless individuals and countries around the globe. It would be a shock to the global economy, several orders of magnitude worse than what the Houthis have already done by attacking shipping routes in the Red Sea. While the Iranians are tightening their grip on Yemen, the Americans are increasing their attacks against Iran's proxy terrorist militias in the region. This week, the U.S. assassinated a senior member of the Iraqi Hezbollah in revenge for the killing of three American soldiers at the Tower 22 base in Jordan earlier this month. This man was Wissam Ahmed Marouf better known by his nickname, Abu Bakr al Saadi, and easily one of the most capable field operatives in Iran's Axis of Resistance network. He was formerly a personal bodyguard of the late Qasem Soleimani and was responsible for overseas operations, quote-unquote, in the Iraqi Hezbollah organization. He is believed to have planned the attack on the Tower 22 base in Jordan, where the American soldiers were killed. Since the Iraqi Hezbollah operation and the American response yesterday, the government in Iraq has found itself between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, the regime that rules in Baghdad issued a statement condemning the U.S. for violating its sovereignty by carrying out these attacks on its own territory. Of course, this was done without permission or existing knowledge. On the other hand, this regime also issues a statement criticizing the Iraqi Hezbollah, which means Iran, which received funds, weapons, and training from the Iranian government. So what can explain this? Well, the Iraqi elite, from the Shiite president through the government ministers and down through the existing bureaucracy, are almost equally divided between dependence on the U.S. and the fear of Iran's iron fist. 
As a historical footnote, both the US forces and the Iranian-backed militias came to Iraq to help this regime get rid of the Islamic State group, or ISIS. If either of them left, the Islamic State would probably pose a threat to this regime once again. However, following this dilemma, the Iraqi government has issued a warning of its intentions to permanently remove the American soldiers from its territory at some unspecified future date. But for the time being, no firm decision has been made. Meanwhile, the Iranians are of course trying to pressure the authorities in Baghdad to throw out the great enemy, quote unquote, the Americans, and direct sharp criticism against Biden, who was unable to prevent the death of three soldiers from the enormous force of the United States in this region. This is an Iranian quote. With all of this in mind, it's worth noting that the Americans have 2,500 soldiers in Iraq on an anti-ISIS mission. There are also US special operations teams deployed in Syrian territory for the same purpose exactly. But since the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza began, there have been hostile encounters between these troops and Iranian-sponsored militias on an almost daily basis. This amounts to a technical violation of the agreement between Washington and Baghdad, leading to a sense by the regime that America has betrayed them. As I said before, no formal decision has yet been announced. But the Baghdad regime is sending signals that it wants the US all the way out of their country sooner rather than later. The Financial Times newspaper reported this week that Iran has used two of the largest banks in the UK to circumvent the heavy economic sanctions imposed on it. The names of these banks will probably sound familiar to many of you. The Lloyds and Santander Bank. The report says the Iranian regime used them to move money around the world to various entities, including in Russia and China. In response, the Santander Bank stated that they are unable to comment on specific customer relationships but emphasized their focus on complying with the sanctions and immediately closed the bank account related to a company called Pisco UK, which is tied, apparently, to the Iranian government. The Lloyds Bank also refrained from specifically responding to these allegations, but claimed that they will comply with any sanction laws. I don't know about you, but hearing this makes me happy. This week, a true friend visited Israel. This is the new president of Argentina, Javier Milay. Throughout his election campaign, he promised that his first visit outside the country would be to Israel. And he fulfilled that promise. During his visit, he announced that he would soon move the Argentinian embassy to Jerusalem and that he would outlaw Hamas. To recap, an already bad headache for the global economy could quickly escalate to something much worse. The US military has begun to retaliate to attacks against it by Iranian-backed proxy militias, and this is forcing the Baghdad regime to issue some tough talk that might lead to serious actions. The Iranian regime received some unwelcome exposure to its clandestine financial activities, which prompted the British banks that allegedly facilitated that activity to shut them down. The new president of Argentina landed in Israel for an unambiguous show of solidarity, bucking the trend of international criticism of the Jewish state over its war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. As we say, there is never a dull moment here in the Middle East. Events that happen here are heard around the world, and especially lately. I'm Mati Shoshani, and I want to thank you for joining me for this week's look at what's going on in our neighborhood. If watching this video was beneficial to you, please subscribe to this channel and share it on social media, and perhaps send it to a friend that could better benefit from understanding what's happening here in the Middle East and why they should be aware of it.